Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Legal Weekly Wine, where we talk about the week's hottest legal topics. This week, we have Fonnie Willis. We've got closing arguments. We're going to kind of wrap that up. I know we don't have a full decision, but we're this close to it. Uh, So by the time that you listen to it, you might have the final decision, but we're going to kind of talk back about what's happened, why it's happened, our opinions, and you can compare them to the final outcome. We are also going to talk about the Supreme Court's acceptance of the privileged immunity case by Trump. So that's two cases that they have accepted. We will hit the other case, which is the 14th Amendment disqualification. And we're going to talk about the fact that Illinois has now joined the other states, including Maine, um, for disqualifying Trump on the ballot. We will then talk about, we're going to talk about Mitch McConnell this week and his um, announcement that he will be retiring at the end of this year and what's going to happen, what that means, what the implications are, as well as a conspiracy theory or two. And finally, we're going to end up with some books. So we're going to talk about those. We always like to do um, suggested reading based on our conversations. Dr. Vi always has some good ones. So those are the topics Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're enjoying our podcast so that you can continue to see them when they come out. And I'm Virginia Tarani. I'm with Tarani Law LLC because you never need a lawyer. Tell you do. And then I'm joined by Chelsea Rogers, who is the other attorney in our office. Welcome back. Glad to be here. And Dr. Vile is joining us. He is the Dean of the Honors College at Middle Tennessee State University. He is our other co-host and we welcome you back too. Good to be here. Okay, with all of our, with all of the topics we're addressing, it is happy hour, and we're drinking sort of. Um, Doctor Vile, let's start with you. What do you have? Yeah, we're back to water. The, <laughs> the the nice grape drink that I had. I made the mistake of having a cola and that grape drink in the evening. Oh, and both. It wasn't until the next morning after I got no sleep that I read that it had the same amount of caffeine as green tea. And that combined with the soda was too much. So okay. very tasty, but so but I'm back to H2O. All right. Well, that's that's lovely. Chelsea, what do you have for the weekly wine? Back with my favorite classic Franzia box wine. <laughs> if they want to sponsor me, let me know. Um, I'm probably <laughs> keeping them in business, um, but it's good. So I'm back with a classic. I love that you actually brought the box this week. Yeah, I'm just going to like open the spout and just directly <laughs> in my mouth. <laughs> You know what? After this week and all of the legal topics, it wouldn't be a surprise. That's what I'm saying. I think I deserve it. Treat yourself. I I do. Now, of all of the weeks, I will say out of however, we've gotten almost 60 episodes now, and this is the first episode I am not drinking real wine or alcohol of some sort. We did have the Jack Daniels episode. Um, So I today am drinking a Martinelli's sparkling cider delicious. So it's at least bubbly and looks like wine and it's the kids wine, right? It's what kids exactly. drink. Exactly. Um, but I'm having surgery on Monday, so I'm going to not drink wine today. And that is an update that we will not be having the weekly wine next week mm-hmm. and possibly two or three weeks. So we're going to see, it, it's unfortunate because there's so much happening. Um, but We're going to see what happens. We will do our best to get through the couple of weeks and be right back with you. So let's get into it. Um, Dr. Vile, pick a topic and let's start. Yes. The Apple Blossom Festival that's held every year in Winchester, Virginia. That's right. It is Apple Blossom. I there with the band, uh, Page County High School Band. And I believe Virginia did some work in that town as well. So I did. I was a prosecutor there for a couple of years. Um, Tell them what's outside the public library in Winchester. The sort of tourist attraction. What is outside the public library? If I remember correctly, there's a big apple outside oh. of New York. Is okay, there not it's a like... big... <laughs> I think I'm remembering that they have a big apple sort of statue right outside the It might still be library. there. I honestly don't know. Well, maybe you didn't go to the library. Okay. Now. I, now. <laughs> well. <laughs> you're busted. There, there might be that. I um, Yeah. Hmm. I, don't, I don't know anyway, about that. I In any I'm case. Right 
<laughs> well, it's a lovely festival. They do a full parade. All of the colors are the pink and the green. People dress up. They go to different dinners. It's quite a lovely time. Um, we used to camp out on people's, There's they go down this one particular road and we would camp out and uh, have barbecues while waiting. So it is quite lovely. All right. So now you have to pick a topic. Which one do you want to start with? As we do Holly Willis, since I mean that's again. You Let's already, do it. In fact, okay, I see the. Apparently, they just concluded maybe the closing arguments. You know, the the fascinating thing about this is, you, you know, Trump wants to. Part of Trump's strategy seems to be delay, hmm. and one way to delay, of course, is to say that the person prosecuting him, uh, that we need to start back from scratch, start all over, which would clearly take it later. But, you know, there do seem to be some genuine, you know, questions. Actually, I'm not quite as concerned about some of the charges as I am about whether the witnesses have been completely forthcoming. Whether they lied. A lot has to do with, you know, was there, rela- you know, not necessarily anything wrong with that. Well, office relationships are almost always problematic. So, right. You know, that's, but, you know, the. The defense, Trump's defense, is essentially claiming that the Fonny Willis has a financial stake in the outcome because she, you know, she paid paid money to the assistant prosecutor, whoever's helping her there. And I don't know that. Well, he's he basically they they both have denied that the relationship occurred before before the trial began, before the hiring began, and that sort of thing. Uh, but now there's a new tranche is that the is that the word uh of mm-hmm. emails you know that suggests that if he wasn't at her place he seems to be in the vicinity an awful lot the tax uh, messages, and, the, yeah. and what's fascinating is the 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 lawyer who was testifying a former associate of wade's i think it was his divorce attorney wasn't it yeah his a guy mm-hmm. named bradley he apparently was communicating with the defense saying, you know, here's when it started and this is what they did. And, you know, if you look through this window, this is what you'll see. Uh, and and they got him on the stand and he suddenly loses his memory. So it it, it seems very problematic. Um, yeah. I, frankly, I doubt that any of this would necessarily relate to the accuracy of any information that has been gathered on Trump. Right. I think, you know, I think there would, there's enough evidence of Trump's wrong. I mean, three or four of these people have already played guilty. So there's Mm -hmm. enough evidence that there's something there that suggests this just isn't a simple witch hunt as, as Trump has somewhat sometimes described it, but it does, you know, it, it brings up enough, question about, you know, the very appearance of impropriety. Right. And it'd be interesting to see, you know, what the judge says. Some people have said, well, you know, if Wade simply stepped down, that might be a way of resolving the immediate issue. Uh, I'm not sure he's inclined to do that or necessarily has to. So it'll, mm-hmm. it'll be interesting to see, you know, the ju- I will say the judge, as far as I can tell, it seems to play it by the book. I mean, he Good. listens attentively to each of the objections in my judgment, seems to answer, you know, I, I couldn't tell a clear side that he was on one way or the other. Uh, seems like a trustworthy person. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see what happens. But it's, um, y- you know, a lot of what's happened over the last week has to do with timing. Uh, you know, we do right. have, now there's there's a criminal trial that starts, supposed to start at the end of March, dealing with Stormy Daniels. That's the New York criminal case. It is. Mm-hmm. But I'm not, you know, there's a question as to how many of Trump's supporters would no longer support him if he were convicted of a felony. Mm-hmm. And I think the answer may be what felony is it? Depends, and right. I do think that there's something unseemly about paying someone to lie about a relationship that you've had. On the other hand, we had a president who did something very similar, and we decided it wasn't an impeachable offense. Right, which was Clinton. Yeah, I mean, some people, Mm -hmm. it it is not as, well, I would qualify a little bit. It's not as directly tied to government corruption as some of the, you know, everybody Mm -hmm. already knows 
true. You yeah. know, if you've seen the interview, the Bush interview with with Trump, we already know his reputation about around women. Nobody's particularly surprised by that. So I don't know if he's convicted on that, if it'll move the needle or not. Chelsea, I, I know you want to say something. Yes. Okay. Because I think, right, the paying of the money to Stormy Daniels is neither here nor there. And I would agree with you. I think most people who support him wouldn't really care. But what I do think is interesting is that it's it's the lying about the business records though, right? Like this is a crime right. of deception, right. which I think we do in the law oftentimes pull those crimes of truthfulness or deception. And I think this would fall under it more than, I don't really care if you paid her or not, but I do think that lying about it and trying to cover it up is maybe, maybe we'll take some of those supporters, um, maybe, you know, and, and push them if, over the edge. If I can go back and maybe I can mention one of my books, we'll just do yeah. it instead of doing a separate, um, you know, part of the problem that Clinton got into mm-hmm. Was yes, it's unseemly having a relationship with an intern. It was a little bit better that she was actually, I think, twenty over twenty one, twenty one or I over. I think twenty two, right? But he was basically impeached not so much for having the affair, for lying. as having lied under oath, right? And so I, I was on a podcast called Scholar Circle, I think it was about a week ago. Nice. I was with two people, one of whom was. Frank Bowman, who I've since corresponded with, he's a uh, he's now an emeritus professor, I believe, from uh, Missouri. This is the best book that I have read in a oh, long time. I've seen that oh, book. I haven't it. read it, but I've seen it. Yeah, not not just on impeachment, but what's <laughs> what's so good? You know, all this stuff runs together after a while. Yeah. So he he's you know he has a, he has the Trump impeachment both. Both Trump, I'm sorry, he has the Clinton impeachment, both Trump impeachments, and even discussions of impeachments that didn't happen but might have. For example, <laughs> uh, political scientists, the emoluments clause. Chelsea, okay, you're the one who. <laughs> oh, God. Usually, oh, God. Yeah, when you I, took when the I, bar you recently. Word, I can tell. You know what an emolument is? Have you discussed that? No, I don't. Okay, that's okay. So an emolument was a term basically for a favor that was given okay. or a gift. So there's a clause in the Constitution that prohibits the president from accepting emoluments, particularly think, yes. from foreign governments or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. this was not ever raised as an impeachment. It, he, Trump was, wasn't impeached for it. But while he was president— there were lots of foreign governments who suddenly began making reservations at his motels. Oh, interesting. And he took many visits to motels where every time he went, there were Secret Service people with him. Right. Uh, he even tried to have a major conference at one of his motels. So the question was, was, you know, he was using, arguably, yeah. the office of his of the presidency in order to gain financial advantages. Well, he wasn't oh, he wasn't impeached for that. But it's right. interesting that he goes through, you know, each of these sort of gray areas and discusses them and he, he and I had a discussion about this because what I like about it is and he does a better job than I do. He tells you what he thinks. Mm. He does it it's not just yeah. but he does it in a way that you know that's what he thinks. Right. But dang it, he's written five, six hundred page book. He's researched impeachments from thirteen hundreds to the present. He's entitled to opinion. I sort of want to know, you know, well, what do you, and he's particularly good in terms of talking about the Mueller investigation and Ooh. you know, sort of what happened and how, in his judgment, it sort of went off the rails. But and that it, was it, the investigation into whom? To to Trump. Okay. It, it was. It was the the investigation by the special counsel as to whether whether Russia had been involved or whether Russia whether the Trump and Trump folks had been enmeshed with the Russians in in attempting to get elected. Okay. And Mueller came up with a. I mean, it, well, in my judgment, it's clear that there were that Trump would have participated if he had been. You know, if they. If he could have gotten them to cooperate more, they would have done more. Mm-hmm. Uh, but whether you know whether it was actually an impeachable offense is still sort of 
you know, on the table. Now for our podcast listeners who are doing audio only, what is the title of the book and the oh, author? I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Frank O. Bowman the Third, High Crimes and Misdemeanors, A History of Impeachment for the Age of Trump, second edition. Excellent. But, I, you know, what was interesting is I, I think, as you know, I, I published an article recently on the or, on impeachment in early America, and I missed this book because I was sort of thrown off by the title. Mm. I saw Age of Trump, and I was doing the origins, but he goes all the way back, but then the, the second half of the book, I mean, think about it. We've had four presidents, no, three presidents actually impeached. Mm. A fourth one would have been if he had stayed on. And one was impeached twice. So within, right. you know, the last however many, from Clinton on, we've had three out of four presidential impeachments. Right. Uh, right. And right now, mm. to continue the discussion, uh, members we've of Congress Biden. are grilling Hunter Biden as to whether, mm. you know, did he have, did he and the president have any contacts? And right. I thought the most interesting thing that I've heard, and I think it's been behind closed doors, but people have sort of leaked what is said. Apparently, there were some conversations where Hunter said, the president is here right beside me, and he's wondering why you haven't done X. And Hunter says, yes, I said it. I'm a, I'm dumb. <laughs> he used an actual, uh, wow. you know, I don't know what I was thinking. I might have been on drugs. The president was not next to me when I made this conversation. Interesting. Uh, so it appears that Hunter was actually trying to use his connection with the president to get advantages to himself. But as far as I can tell so far, the president, the president had said from the beginning, you know, this is where, you know, I'm we not don't, in we this. Don't use, right. Yeah. You know, this is, you know, I'm not to be involved in this. Mm -hmm. So, so let's, I don't, let's move this conversation since we've been talking now about Trump and the criminal case right. in New York, the Stormy Daniels issue where he apparently paid hush money, but then covered it up through essentially tax fraud is how I look at it, um, of, you know, lying about how, what he did with it, how he paid it, how he used his attorney to pay it and then repay it. So in the, my idea of it, when I look at all of it in layman's terms is it's basically tax fraud. So we now have the civil case in New York concluded. So let's hop there since it is seeming to be a money fraud issue mm -hmm. because it's a similar case, right? It's claims that Trump did something fraudulent, something dishonest, deceitful, a lie about his businesses right. in New York and the civil case is already concluded. And it was what? $350 million roughly judgment. And then add another hundred million for, mm -hmm. for interest. And apparently yeah. I think it's a hundred thousand dollars a day. I, I think uh, so too. Like one to one, ten hundred. Yeah. 100 or $110,000 a day in post judgment interest. That's yeah. accruing. So every day he doesn't pay, he's accruing this as interest because I believe it's 10% interest on the amount. Now, this is an accrual. So if it was 350, mm -hmm. just to use the numbers, and now it's 460, well, now the 10% is accruing on 460, right. not yeah. 350. So it's, it's continuing more. Well, I know I, your office is doing very well. Have you have you gotten a call to ask if you would help front the money for him yet? I, I have not. Um, he may have to take <laughs> my measly either. tax and, you know, returns. I've been a professor for 30, 40 years. <laughs> but and he so hasn't far, called. No one's, no one's called. Yeah. Well, I, it is my theory that he should go and get a loan on Shark Tank. <laughs> I like it because what, Mr. Wonderful? Yes. Mm -hmm. As actually, as I understand it, says... Nothing going on here that doesn't go on in Shark Tank. Or... It always <laughs> happens. We always do this as businessmen. Yeah. I think he's a Canadian. Am I right? No, it's the other. Well, maybe it is, I but I Mr. knew. Mr. Wonderful is. Is he? I'm I thought it was sure. only the, is it Robert? What's this other? The other guy I love okay. who is definitely Canadian. I don't know if he's well, still on you there. You better but... not quote me on that, but I, I believe that they're, I believe he's also Canadian in, in any event. 
Yeah. So no, he is. My biggest concern was the attorney. I mean, everybody seems to be deceitful. I swear. I, I just, and all of these attorneys, bless them. If they did or didn't do anything wrong in the Fonnie Willis issue, they all look bad. Yeah. They and they do. all make us look bad. You know, there's yeah. a reason attorneys get a bad rap and it's these cases and these high, you know, impact cases where just, just do the right thing. Don't lie. And I think, Dr. Vile, to go to that, I think the biggest, I agree that the biggest issue, honestly, is not the affair mm -hmm. as to whether they perjured themselves. Right. And if there's proof that they perjured themselves on the stand, then they should be removed. The bar should investigate them. And quite frankly, I would argue that they should be disbarred. Because right. we tell our witnesses, don't lie on the stand. We are held to, in as attorneys, you have to be candid with the court, right. candor with yeah. the tribunal. I mean, it's in all of our ethics codes. If they perjured themselves, what's going to stop them from putting someone up on the stand and eliciting perjury to <laughs> win their case in any other prosecution? Like, I think that should be this barred. But so, and, so let's go back to. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that's fascinating about Trump is the more he's indicted, the more his popularity rises. Right. Is he the object of sympathy for thinking, well, who in the world could come up with 450 some million dollars? Uh, and right. what bothers me the most, frankly, about the Trump case is to whom is he going to be indebted if he does get a $450 million loan. Right. Uh, Who would give him the money? Well, and could it be a foreign government? Could Saudi Arabia uh, put the money down? Or could Russia put it down? Right. Uh, and with that, now, of course, he's not president at the time. But if it continued into his presidency, would that be a violation of the emoluments clause? Right, that he would still have gotten a benefit that continues. Yeah. Well, the 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 attorney claims whatever her name is, and I apologize that I don't know it offhand. I it, I feel terrible about it, but his his attorney, I heard her on an interview saying, "Oh, he has it." We're ready to put it down. Well, I hope she's not lying, too. You know, here's another attorney who well, but does. That's, that's not under oath. It's not, right? but it doesn't I mean, matter. Not, no. You're lying to the entire I, I mean, American right, okay. public. As your father, I'm not encouraging you to lie other than under oath. But she can say that. Would she want to say that in a courtroom? She might, you know. But, yeah. but here's where Trump has been sort of hoisted on his own petards, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, he has made the claim that he has hundreds of millions of dollars lying right. around. Right, that he can just, it's assets. accessible. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, it would bother me if I couldn't immediately make a loan, you know, if I were, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that Trump has more than half a billion dollars. He could pay this, but, you know, just like, you know, I could, whatever the amount of, you know, I could probably pay 500000 if I had to. Um, but I wouldn't want somebody selling my house to raise it. Right. And I think that's the issue is a lot of it is tied up in property. Right. Right. And what's, what's happening then with this is the judge has now ruled that he's not going to, um, basically put it on pause while well, he's I appealing. Also the, they offer Trump offered, as I understand it, well, I can put up a hundred million. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't uh, enough. Said, I mean, no, that's... that wasn't the judgment. The judgment's four hundred, and and you know, added to this, of course, is the other civil case, which he's already yes. lost. Now, the I New believe York he Times has won. put up five million uh, for E. Jean Carroll, mm -hmm. but I believe there's another fifty-six somewhere along in there million judgment that he's you know well, also he's got has that he three. Has not Pardon? He paid it was he's got three in the in the news. There was the one with the New York Times that allegedly he's fully well, that paid was that only one. a million or two. <laughs> I think <laughs> that yeah. was small potatoes. We're only talking real money here. <laughs> right. So he fully paid that. And then he's you're right. He's got the E. Jean Carroll case that he has to pay. And if I were her, I'd be 
begging to to start liquidating his assets so I could get some because she's the first judgment. So she's first in line. Well, I think she's going to have, I think she, he has put up the five million at least in escrow or whatever he needs to well, do. Well, that's the first case. That's not the right. second one. Another 70 some, right. So now, I mean, so now we're at four cases. So right. all of which have been ruled against him in the civil cases. So if you combine them all, which I should have done the math before the show, but we're looking at, at over 500 million easily. Exactly. At yeah. least. Yeah. So how he's going to pay them all off while no one's put it on hold I don't know. And technically, you even though he's done the notice to appeal in the civil fraud case in New York, I don't know if it will actually go through if he hasn't put up the money plus an extra for the the cost and, and, and interest. I mean, are they going to start, you know, if he was elected, you know, garnishing the president's wages? Like, what is going to happen? You legally can. <laughs> That's what you, I'm saying. Like, are we going to really have a... I think we all need, if you support Trump, I think you should go out and buy a pair of tennis shoes. Well, there's that, too, because that's coming out. And then there's the possible going public of Truth Social, mm -hmm. where he could be making money. And that's certainly another possible avenue of funds, which seems a lot better than Russia or Saudi Arabia or anything else. Um, okay, so... Goodness. And we've got, so we've got to hold on to see if it actually can, if the civil fraud case can actually be appealed, whether he's going to pay any money. The two E. Jean Carroll cases, the New York Times one is now done. And then we're going to look for the criminal case because it's still anticipated that it's going to start this month in March. And right now, that's, that's the, the one that Daniels. does correct the Stormy Daniels case. That does not seem to be continuing that seems to be the one that's pretty solid for a date and, and the two cases that the two other are the two or three at least two other there are three cases. other cases right i mean mar-a-lago dealing mm -hmm. with documents uh and that D i think yeah. there they're arguing they've been arguing this week as to whether they want to start in july mm -hmm. or whether they want to do it in august right either would one would actually fall during the Republican National Convention, which would be fairly, fairly interesting. And then, yeah. you know, the, the, the Willis case may or may not go forward depending, you know, right. expeditiously depending on whether there's a reassignment. And then you had the election interference case. And that's the case essentially the that one. they can't move forward until the Supreme Court hears the case in late April. Right. Typically, as I have easily learned as a political science professor, if you want people to interview you, you're always in town the last two weeks in June. Yes. Because that's when the big Supreme Court cases typically come down. And it does, you know, these these cases raise some fascinating questions, which is, <laughs> and I can see both sides, The American people, in a sense, have the right to know whether somebody who's running for president, particularly in the case of in this Illinois case that you mentioned, you know, yes. you know, you, you've had Colorado and Maine and now Illinois who have tried to get uh, Trump off the ballot on the basis that he's an insurrectionist. Well, it'd be better to know that before you cast your vote for someone who might be called an insurrectionist than afterward. On the other hand, if if the shoe were on the other foot, if I thought, well, let's take the Biden impeachment. If the Biden impeachment were not an impeachment but were a criminal case, and I thought, as I do, that it's just a bogus, it's just a political right. theater kind of thing, how would I feel about having that trial during the election? And I would say, well, this awful. obviously, you know— this isn't a legal thing. This is just a way of politically embarrassing someone. So there are some arguments, you know, and, and then the other argument is, should the Supreme Court, what is it, let justice prevail, the, the heavens may fall, or something to that effect? I love uh, it, but I don't know it. Well, I, I haven't quoted it exactly, but it's a, 
it, it's it's in Latin, so we huh. need to look up the Latin, and I can't remember what the Latin is, but you know, basically, some people say you you do the right thing no matter what the consequences, mm-hmm. and there are others who say, well, you know, the Supreme Court really ought to consider the consequences for the election. You know, should should they just ignore the fact that we're going to have an election in November and that doesn't affect their timing? Because, mm-hmm. you know, particularly on this immunity case, right? I honestly was of the opinion that the court might very well say you have a district court, yes. you have a unanimous appellate court, the issue's pretty quite cut and dry, just don't take the, just deny cert. It'll leave those judgments in place. You and I, I both thought that was going to happen. Books, right? For the history books, you know, when I write my next edition of a companion to the U.S. Constitution, I'd prefer to have a Supreme Court citation to say, we have finally decided that a president is or is not immune for possible criminal activity. Well, you know, seems a oh, hard you know, for, for someone who's always taught that even the king is not above the law. It's not a really hard, difficult issue for me, but if it needs to be resolved, I suppose I'd prefer for the Supreme Court to do it than to be relying on a district or an appellate court somewhere. Other well, lower and I tell you, so this is the D.C. case that's been picked up, and you and I both thought it would just be they deny cert, but now it has been approved to, to be heard. Right before the Supreme Court on the privileged immunity issue is, is the president immune from prosecution for acts that were committed during his presidency? Well, and it, you know, people, viewers need to, to look at it. Right. The Supreme Court has phrased a spe- more yes. specific issues for official acts. Now, the Correct. problem with that is, I think, is is it an official act to try to overturn an election. Well, I mean, yeah, sure I think that, that's the question. Yeah, they've certified a specific question, and right, I haven't I read you, it off. Yeah, I think the specific question is, do you have immunity for all official acts that you've done as president? But They're going to have to define an official act. They will yeah. have to in order to answer that question. Well, and I hope they're careful about it. Because I, you know, I hope every act that you do as president doesn't become an effect. You know, if if it does, then you know you don't want to send your daughters uh, as interns to the White House, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and apologies for my dogs. Problem solved. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. No. It, it, so I, I think the most interesting piece to me of this case was when the circuit court um, asked the question, the the very pointed question of, are you saying that his immunity goes so far that if he assassinates another person, right? What What's the particular phrase, Chelsea? I don't remember the exact phrasing. It was worded so well, though, in the, we've talked about it before. It'll come back. It's going to be in yeah, like three maybe, minutes. It's going to come back. Maybe SEAL team, That's whatever. What it is were yes. to assassin, you know, assassinate your rival, would that be an official? Uh, right, yeah. and he was forced into a corner and had to say yes. If it's d- done during the presidency, then right. that would be, he would be immune. And and to me, it's <laughs> such, if that is true, if that is accepted, what do you think the Trump camp would say if Biden now in presidency went and murdered Trump? They'd be up in arms. Of course you can't do this. That's not within your presidential rights. Well, I mean, so only you can murder do him, it. Lock him up in Guantanamo Bay. Send the Navy SEALs to go arrest him and, and lock him up without due process, right? It's an official act. Exactly. I, I, crazy. Why would we have a president when we could have a king, apparently? Like, what is the difference it, then? I don't think it's a king so much as a dictator, but whatever. Yeah, there you go. Kings were dictators. Well, Off that, with their and heads. The, we well, need that's to bring true. in Lewis Carroll here, huh? That's right. That's right. Henry VIII, we'll have, we'll have that. Um, again, don't send your daughters to the White House. So, <laughs> <laughs> so with that, okay, I think we've talked about all of those. Are we missing any? Oh, McCarthy, uh, not McCarthy. Oh, my gosh. I'm thinking back into Nixon <laughs> era. Um, McConnell. McConnell. Mitch McConnell. Thank you. Mitch McConnell, we want to hit that topic, and then we'll go to the books and conclude for the day. Mitch McConnell, Senate Majority Leader, right? 
Mm-hmm. Um, Dr. Vile, uh-huh. you're the political scientist of the group. Well, um, you know, <laughs> McConnell has been one of the longest serving in that position. Mm-hmm. I think the great tragedy of McConnell, and this is going to show my bias, but it's open, is you get up one day, okay, first you elect, you know, you, you allow an impeachment to start. You don't till the end of it say, well, I don't think, you know, I don't, I'm not going to vote for impeachment. You get up the next day and say, mm-hmm. I didn't vote for impeachment, but he can be tried now. Uh, mm-hmm. And he'll always be responsible. And then he's back cozying ah. up to him. You know, there was a chance if the leaders of the Republican mm-hmm. Party had gotten together, they could have they could have kept Trump from ever leading their party again. But they all equivocated. They all went down to Mar-a-Lago, kissed the ring. And frankly, you know, and maybe it'll succeed. You know, in some polls, uh, Trump is ahead of Biden right now for the next election. So maybe, you know, maybe they'll have the satisfaction of victory. But to me, they're going to have ashes in their mouth at the end. Uh, That's not what I think the Republican Party should be. But that's clearly coming from a... A standpoint. <laughs> well, and everybody's entitled to their opinion. Gotcha. Um, so, so with with him retiring, it's my understanding he's not retiring until November. So this is not an immediate issue. Oh, from the, from from that position. Now he's mm-hmm. not actually leaving the Senate till the end of his term. And when right. is the end of his term? I'm not sure. Uh, I think it's 26, though. I I, I believe he has two more years. So or, even with technically be 27, I may be wrong on that. Okay, so even with his retirement from the position, he will still hold a Republican seat in the That's Senate. That's my understanding. Yes. Okay. And so, actually if he were to retire, I believe now it's different for the House and the Senate, so I, I I'm going to speculate a little here. In one or the other the governor can appoint a replacement at least until an election is called. And I believe the current governor of of Kentucky is is a Democrat. So it's very unlikely that he would resign a seat and allow uh, somebody from the other party to to appoint his replacement. So he is really trying to hold on to the seat. Right. What will happen? Who will get and how would they get or or petition for or, you know— become a candidate for the Senate Majority Leader. May I make a prediction? Please. Okay, I mean, yeah, this will shock your audience. Oh, I'm excited. I believe the Republicans will choose someone who is more charismatic than Mitch McConnell. (laughs) (laughs) Is that possible? (laughs) Uh, Yes, I I think so. Well, apart from from that prediction, the type of person, do you have a prediction on the person who it might be? Well, there are a couple people in line that are like uh, whips or, you know, second in command. And it'll it'll probably be much like what you saw with Mike Johnson. You know, Scalise was sort of next. And well, there was actually somebody before Johnson, wasn't there? I don't remember. It, you know, well, but they he looked was at, the house. McHenry was for a time was sort of an interim sort of they basically chose from the people that were the the lead, the other leaders sort of next in line and fought it out. Uh, and it's possible, though, in November, if this I mean, there are other elections than just the president. I mean, there are Senate elections, right? Yes. So it's possible well, a third it, of the Senate every two years. It wouldn't even be a Senate majority leader because That's it right. might shift to the Democrats. That's right. So, is there a secondary posi- position for all of our non political scientists? Is there a secondary position then that the Republicans would still hold uh, that's oh, yeah. similar? Senate but minority leader. There we go. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, it's still a top position. It's just Absolutely. dependent on party, whether it's the majority or minority leader. Right. Right. Okay, perfect. Now, Chelsea, I'm going oh, to you. Hole of we're going to the rabbit hole. It was. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of. Cons- we're going to do fact. Okay, we're definitely going to do the facts yes. that we know. But there is a little bit of a conspiracy theory around this retirement notice. Correct. Yes, and so I. This is the thing. I went down all of the rabbit holes, guys. All of the 
creepy conspiracy corners of the internet. Um, and my conclusion, obviously, this is fully my opinion. I don't know what the benefit or conspiracy is after reading everything I could get my hands on. I, I don't know what the conspiracy is. However, after this n- uh, notice of resignation, his sister-in-law died mm. in a way that is um, odd, to say the least. So what we know here in the facts um, is that his wife's sister um, died in some sort of car drowning incident um, about 40 miles outside of Austin, Texas mm-hmm. on private property when apparently she backed her Tesla into the pond lake situation. Um, for some reason, I this is my first question, who called the police then? Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't find any reporting on, on who made that call. And um, we do know like, you know, fire and rescue eventually came out, attempted to perform life-saving measures unsuccessfully. Mm. Um, but very strange. The reporting has been very strange. And some of the international reporting, um, very close to the incident, actually said it was a collision, which which, which is not true. Um, some of some of the um, international newspapers and TV shows have reported that it was some sort of collision, which is not true. Or it not that we know of. Well, no. So at least the the sheriff in the county and um, some other investigators have given statements saying that it is being investigated as a crime. But and excuse me, my puppies are running around. If you can hear them, mine pitter patter in the back. Been barking like crazy. I apologize. Oh no worries. But so they've said that it, it's still being investigated um, as a crime, but foul play is not suspected. Which I don't know what that means. I don't Just, aren't know. Is how that- it's a crime <laughs> and in foul play is not suspected. Maybe I'm dumb. Maybe I'm just like not piecing things together. Aren't there so, synonyms? So let me pull something in if I may. <laughs> Please and do, because this- I am I'm at a loss. Okay, so so this actually is in this book that I mentioned. When President Clinton was in office, one of his top aides, a guy named Vince Foster, committed suicide. Mm. And there were this was about the time of the Whitewater investigation. And so there's all kinds of questions that swirled as to whether a, a lot of conspirators at the time thought that, you know, it must have been related to this. Mm-hmm. You know, he he had guilty knowledge of something or the Clintons eliminated him because, you know, he was an attorney and knew what he shouldn't know. None of it, as far as I can tell, well, none of it ever proved, proved to be truthful. Uh, sometimes a suicide is just a suicide. A car wreck is just a car wreck. I think we had talked before coming on in Tennessee, just you know, fairly oh. recently, there was a police officer who mm. had arrested a woman, put her handcuffed her in the back seat, and apparently just took a wrong turn into a lake, and they both ended up dying. Mm. Uh, mm. You know, I'm sure, you know, you could probably make a conspiracy of it, but it's you know, accidents do happen. Just a tragedy. Uh, And by the way, uh, McConnell's wife, uh, as many of you know, you know, they were a power couple. They were a little Mm -hmm. bit like the Doles. Uh, Elaine Chow uh, was the, what was her position? It was a cabinet position. I don't know if it, I want to say like transportation or agriculture. I cannot remember exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, transportation secretary uh, in the Trump administration. And what's interesting is that she she actually resigned after I believe I don't know if it was January 11th or whether it was prior to that time, but she you know she did not go along with the theory that you know there's been some vast conspiracy that had kept Trump from being reelected and she just she just resigned and her husband for a time sort of seemed to go along with her but then you know after the fact they sort of reconciled. Mm. Okay, so Dr. Vile, I know you have a couple of books. We oh, want to yeah. do we want to do our book corner right now. Okay. Um, do some well, extra let's, books let's for mention, reading. I mentioned this program that I was on Scholar Circle. The the other scholar that was there, Jeremy Suri, is from University of um, Texas at Austin. Civil War by Other Means: America's Long and Unfinished Fight for Democracy. And what's fascinating, you know. This last election is not the only disputed election we've had in American history. 1800, of course, 1801, you had Jefferson and Burr. Uh, 1876, uh, 
you had a conflict between Hayes and Tilden, mm -hmm. in which Tilden appeared to have won the popular vote, but lost the uh, lost lost the electoral vote after a commission awarded all the uncontested votes to him. And it was at the end of that, you know, part of the compromise, Hayes was a Republican. Republicans had had uh, troops in the South to enforce, basically to protect the rights of the freedmen, uh, many of whom were subjected to violence by, you know, Ku Klux Klan and others. And this is sort of the story of, you know, how how we made this tremendous progress in a way in the Civil War, and then we backslid for, you know, close to 100 years. It went into the 50s and the 60s, you know, Brown versus Board of Education and then civil rights laws that were adopted that we sort of got close. Uh, and I, I guess if any, I mean, some of it is very shocking. You, you just read, you know, read stories of mob violence taking place and, uh, you know, things that you would associate with Putin's Russia or mm. you know, somewhere else in the world. But it, it's there's there's a very good lesson in there that, you know, democracy is you don't just suddenly achieve it and, and it, it's there forever. Uh, it, it Like houses, it requires upkeep. Mm. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we, we like to portray this is particularly true. You know, I do a lot on the amending process and we like to we like to portray amendments as sort of progress of democracy. Right. Uh, but sometimes we take steps backward and sometimes we take a step backward while we're moving forward. And you know, mm -hmm. people for a long time praised Jacksonian democracy, you know, the rise of the common man. Right. Well, that's what it was. It was the common white man. Mm -hmm. uh, blacks didn't have the right to vote. Women oh, the didn't Indian, have the right to vote. Uh, or what was called the Indian population at the time. Right. Native, Native Americans. Americans were shipped off to, you know, Oklahoma. Uh, what the, those who remained, um, and you know sometimes, and and th this is why it's so tricky. You know, I'm I'm not one of those the the sixteen nineteen crowd that, you know, thinks everything in America has to be judged by, you know, by one incident or whatever. But you know, just as we talked last week, no, probably no nation has had had a virgin birth or immaculate conception. Um, but sometimes we get closer to our ideals than we do at other times. Mm. And it's, you know, it's a constant. And that's why, you know, voting rights are so important because right. sometimes if, you know, if I don't have enough sympathy for a minority or people different from me, hopefully there are enough of them that they can in part look out for themselves. Right. Uh, I don't, you know, uh, I don't want somebody... <laughs> deciding whether I deserve my rights or not. I'm going to go to the polls and try to protect them. Right. Uh, that's why it's important that everybody, you know, have a voice. And I like that you say that because um, my husband and I, we live in Maryland. Um, that's where I work primarily. And we were talking about the upcoming election in November and we're like, well, we're going to go cast our votes, even if they don't count, um, depending because our state is one party. Right. And I don't know what we're going to do this year. I got to say, I honestly don't know. Um, I think that I know what I'm going to do, but it kind of depends on how things turn out. But in the prior years, we have definitely voted, not all the time, but we have definitely slanted on the Republican side. And on those years, we're like, yeah, we'll go throw away our vote because Maryland is Democrat, right? Well, what What is it going to count? But with the popular vote... There's that question of what's counted in the popular vote versus the electoral college. So there, yeah. there's a lot of those, you know, go make your vote count. Go vote. So one more book. Please. Uh, you're in Maryland. So mm -hmm. Maxwell Stearns is a professor at the University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law. Mm -hmm. Chelsea, do you know him? You know. I don't. Okay. Well, he's a professor there, and he's written a book called Parliamentary America. Mm. Um, anyone who wants to read through two volumes of my Encyclopedia of Constitutional Amendments knows that at least since Woodrow Wilson and even before, there have been those who thought we should have a parliamentary system. In a parliamentary mm. system, your, your chief of government is the head of the majority party. Uh, so you elect a party and then it would be Mitch McConnell, right? Well, or would it probably be the, whoever the speak, 
the Speaker of the House or, or the head Republican in the or whatever the party would be. Um, but he has, and I, I've, and I've, I've written to him too. I, every time I read a book, I gotta, I gotta write to the author, and I don't particularly support the, all the suggestions here. But he has one that's very clever. Uh, I have long thought that the House of Representatives is probably too small. Each representative now has to represent close to 750 to 800,000 people. That seems like a stretch. And a lot of people, so he basically calls for doubling the size of the House of Representatives. But what he does that's interesting is, and, and I did commend him on this, he knows that he, he favors proportional representation. Mm -hmm. So each party would get, you know, if you had 10 votes and Republicans had 60 percent, they would get six votes and the Democrats four votes. And you would have a party list and whoever they've listed it, you know, they would be selected. Hmm. He realizes that if you propose that, it would never it would never be adopted as an amendment because it didn't ever get through the House. Nobody wants to give up their comfortable seat, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but what he proposes, hmm. if I'm understanding him right, is that you would leave each existing district in place, but then your overall total, the, the doubling that you would do, they would have to come from, they would have to represent the, they would have to proportion it out according to the state. Mm. So if, if Democrats uh, gerrymander districts so that 60, you know, let's say they have 55% of the vote and they gerrymander so they have 70%, that 70% of their first 435 would be offset in the with those who were added. It's so a little bit it's confusing. Complicated. It, it's complicated. It's really a very clever plan. Um, and again, you I need do a not, math degree for that. Some kind of statistics. Well, you, probably, you probably would. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we have computers now, right? We do. Um, but that, so. that's like you have to know what to enter, though, first. <laughs> right. well, I, I always had does, issues right? with percentages. I'm not going to lie. It, it was an issue. <laughs> but yes, yeah, someone does. All right. So that wraps us up. Stay tuned in the news, you all, for the Fonnie Willis decision. Stay tuned for the Supreme Court. Two weeks, Co by the way. They're going to have I, a decision in two weeks. I was just CNN. They're saying the judges said he will try to decide that within the next two weeks. Perfect. Well, maybe we will have another episode by then. Um, if not, certainly the following week. But um, stay tuned in the news for that. Stay tuned for any decision that might be made by the Supreme Court on the disqualification clause. We will have to wait for a little while on the privileged immunity clause since that will be heard in April. Watch the Trump trial that is right now still set for March for this month for New York for the criminal fraud case. And then I guess the privilege, yeah, the privileged immunity case and what happens with timing on the documents case for Trump. So those are the big things that we know of in the news. There's always something extra, but Watch out for the hottest topics in the legal news each week. Hottest legal topics in the news each week. There we go. And in the meantime, don't forget that we're going to take a quick break. We will be back as soon as possible. We wish you a lovely March, and we will catch you next time on the Legal Weekly Wine. <laughs> 